Armina, thank you so much for this generous invitation, generous <laughs> presentation, and your warm uh, collegiality. Thank you so much for that. I wish it is very pity now we are sharing the virtual forum with you and our, your students, my future colleagues, my friends, uh, virtually. It's pity. I wish I, I had been grads right now, but this is the that we can have right now. Uh, just I would like to say two things before I start to share my screen. The first thing is that, uh, thank God uh, it is not COVID, but I've been suffering with a quite heavy seasonal flu. If I will cough sometimes or you will some dizzling in my uh, voice, please excuse me. I'll have enough water with me. I'll try to solve this issue within this one hour. The second thing is that as Almira told that, I mean, when she invited me to give my speech, I thought I'll only speak about my brand new book, Religion, Identity and Power in uh, Turkey and the Balkans within the new millennium. Then I thought that it would be better for us to speak all the Turkey's transformation while scrutinizing religion and identity and power relations, scrutinizing the Justice and Development Party Erdogan's period, and then talk about its reflections to the Balkans. because. One of the main issues of this topic that my colleagues mostly making this polls, this without understanding Turkey's historical background, without understanding the general actors, and without understanding the main critical junctions of Turkey, it is very difficult to understand the current role, position, discussions of Turkey in the Balkans. So I will so in this regard, we will we will walk a little bit of the corridors of theory corridors of history, and then we will talk about the real politics together. Now, if I can manage, I'll try to share my screen with you via this WebEx. And I think now it's, it's all right, yeah? Okay. Yes, so, yes, you yes, can, you can yeah. say it. Uh -huh. Okay, so this is the title. Now I'm getting rid of this play. I mean, as I said about the background of today's lecture, I mean, this lecture, I mean, is also a little bit of a collective and a very large summary of my new book. Because, I mean, before that book, if I'm wrong, I'm gonna, my, correct me, there wasn't any single study regarding Turkey's role in the Balkans as a full book. We have lots of very valuable articles. We have lots of very valuable policy reports, but we didn't have that much about uh, that much about the Turkey's role and particularly Turkey's religious oriented, identity oriented and power oriented activities in the Balkans. But after that, what well, I realized that, I mean, all of these policy reports articles, this is some lack parts. This is, this is about the historical background coming from the late Ottoman Empire period and linked with the contemporary Turkey's today's actions. So, when we look at the today's Turkey's role in the Balkans, what we saw that many different approaches, but at the end of most of the approaches is linked between, so it is linked with some particular point, which is about whether Turkey is an international or an outsider actor, which has been pursuing different regulations of soft power as a foreign policy implementation to the Balkans. Therefore, I would like to discuss at the same time whether Turkey is a soft power or not, whether Turkey's instrumentalization of religion, instrumentalization of hybrid understanding of identity and instrumentalization of power relation historical uh, factors to the Balkans, whether it might be considered as a soft power or not. So in this regard, I will talk a little bit about the uh, concept of soft power, how soft power has been understood in foreign policy and, and how we can create an interconnected relations between religion and soft power. And then I will move to the religion and politics in contemporary Turkey, because what I believe that without understanding of the role of religion in Turkey, without understanding the focal position of uh, religion in Turkey's domestic politics, it is very difficult for us to understand the Turkey's uh, foreign policy activities in the contemporary times, because today is the, is the period of, we can easily argue that, the intersectionality between Turkey's domestic and foreign policy has reached, it is, peak points. After we talk about all of these issues, I will talk about ever transforming, very complicated justice and development part period. 
one of the main aim that I, I would like to speak about the Justice and Development Party period is that without understanding different actors, such as who is Erdogan, such as who is uh, Justice and Develop what is Justice and Development Party, what is Gila movement, what is the Eurasianist, what is Sunni Islamic actors, or what kind of state approaches is Diyanet? It, it would be very difficult for us to understand Turkey's current activities in the Balkans. And then at the end of the uh, session, I will mostly talk about the last parts of my book, and uh, I will talk about how Turkey has been perceived uh, from the Balkan elites, from different countries, uh, elites, uh, with its new role, with its new identity, with its new power connotation. So this is the plan for today. As I said, I mean, when I'm told, when I'm, when I'm, uh, when I'm uh searching some of the literatures when i'm searching uh some of the policy papers or when i talk with the local elites in turkey and in the balkans i'm always hearing two different uh phrases the first is that within the justice and development party period we realize that turkey is back with a full force, with a high visibility, with a high impact, involving every different kind of issues, Turkey is back to the region. But what kind of back is that? I mean, this is not the first time that we can hear that Turkey back argument. For example, uh, my, our, our common colleagues, Dimitar Bechev's 2012 article, we, we saw that, yes, Turkey is back. But what is the role of being a Turkey is back? I mean, within this back, Turkey's back motto, Turkey's back plantation, we also saw that Turkey has been using different kind of soft power instrumentalizations while using religious, historical, cultural, and uh, history oriented tools and being a very important soft power actor in the region. But I mean, Turkey is back. And what we know that Turkey, this is not a big hit on that, there is a huge, very visible anti-democratization or uh, democratic backsliding in Turkey's current regime. The Turkey's current economic condition has been shrinking dramatically. Turkey is not uh, one of the emerging uh, market anymore. Turkey is not the place that we can see that a kind of a uh, reback to the brain drain, so on and so forth. So how Turkey can be a, a soft power while instrumentalizing, instrumentalizing religion, identity, and power connotations? So so when you look at this, and and also when we look at the Turkey's position in within the new millennium, and to understand with this position, it is not important. It is not only important to scrutinize its role in the Balkans, but at the same time, Turkey has been arguing that it has been implementing same foreign policy methodologies with different countries, such as France, such as. Uh, in Sweden, in United Kingdom, even in the United States. So how it can be uh, possible using same tools, using same uh, policy making strategies, but getting the same reactions from different regions. So in this regard, for example, when you look at these uh, quotations from different actors, for, so for example, Ibrahim Kalan in 2011, the president's spokesperson of Turkey, argued that Turkey's soft power is very different from other countries because Turkey has a very huge potential coming coming from its culture, coming from its religion, coming from its historical experiences. Yes, this is the one side of the coin. But on the other side of the coin, for example, Bulgarian uh, head Grand Mufti uh, Haji, Haji Mustafa uh, argued that in, 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 in an interview that he took with me, and he underlined that I mean, the Turkey's understanding of foreign policy and the foreign policy implementation has changed, dramatically changed after the first decade of the new millennium. But within this, within this soft power implementation, what we hear from the uh, uh, Haji Mustafa's quote, there is a religion dimension. And if we would like to define Turkey as a kind of a soft power, we can only define it as a as a kind of a religious soft power, but what does it mean that religious soft power? And and also, I mean, the in the in the French uh, ministry that I conducted an interview in 2018. 
the senior officer told me that, yes, we can consider Turkey as a soft power, not only in the Balkans, but at the same time all around the world. But synthesizing with Islam and nationalism and using all of these normative arguments in an over those ways would be very harmful for Turkey's soft power uh, foreign policy desires, arguments and claims. So how we can define Turkey? Oops, how I can, yeah, how we can define Turkey? I mean, indeed, I mean, the religion, religious soft power, identity, identity oriented soft power, soft power and the soft powers implementation by cultural elements is not the first thing that we saw with Turkey. Starting from Joseph Nine, that he coined the term in 19, late 1980s and then uh, like cooked the term uh, very well in 1990s and then developed it a little bit in the first uh, decade of the new millennium. What we know from soft power, soft power is something that countries can convince the elites and the ordinary people's behaviors, uh, ideological patterns, and the perceptions according to their countries while using not only hard power tools like wise military and economy, but combining with the material and the normative uh, components of soft power and use them as a tool for foreign policy. After Joseph Nine, many, likewise Jeffrey Haynes, Thomas Steiner, Steiner Wells, they use soft power with many different actors and with many, many different, uh, many different cases. For example, Pope Francis and his his uh, initiatives for the pra Paris Climate uh, Agreement or the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, they have been mostly show that religion, identity, power, and culture can be used as an element of soft power, as the Turkish uh, current Turkish administration argued. But at the same time, what we know that religion, culture, identity, power, they are very ambivalent actors. And as uh, as Daniel Philpot and Scott Appleby of Notre Dame universities, as they argued that if you are using some ambivalent concepts to define one country's foreign policy and foreign policy activities under the umbrella of soft power, I mean, this, this notion's ambivalence one way or another occupy the ambivalence of the soft power structure. And in this regard, in this book, or when, I mean, uh, at the end of this lecture, I will argue that if one would like to define Turkey's current religion identity and power implementation as a kind of a soft power in on the Balkans, it would be better to define it as an ambivalent soft power and ambivalence of power and the ambivalence is makes all of these foreign policy implementations is a two-sided coin one side is very quote-unquote uh very positive the other side has some very significant problematic points and with all of these problematic points what we saw that i mean the if one would like to define define one country's soft power, I mean, we have to scrutinize a couple of issues. The first thing is that we have to scrutinize one country's historical relations with that, uh, the, the, the countries that would like to implement soft power very clearly, because when you would like to impose your, not hard power, but soft foreign policy implementations, you have to underline your historical background your common sh uh, common shared past, uh, your experiences together. The second thing is that you have to promote yourself, or very ordinary speaking, you have to sell yourself. While using your uh, well-functioned democracy, you you should use your very functioning, rich and efficient economy, and at the same time, very functioning, uh, very well-designed transnational state apparatus because these are your material material tools that you can implement uh, as a as a soft power tool but at the same time if there is a problem with the normative side of your soft power and there is a uh, oxymoronic structure between the normative soft power and the material soft power this 
soft power still would be defined as an ambivalence, as Peter Mandeville and Shadi Hamidi argued. So within this theoretical background, I think Turkey and the Balkans and the Turkey and the Balkan relations would be a perfect match to define how 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 soft power could be an ambivalent actor, ambivalent structure for uh, for this uh, for this for that kind of relations. So, in this regard, in the book, after scrutinizing uh, after scrutinizing the relations between the Balkans and Turkey, to, starting from the late Ottoman Empire period, I claim three different things. The first thing is that states can easily adapt of religion in foreign policy, and at the same time culture, and at the same time their ideology, and their efforts to absorb power by playing religion card may be implemented as a soft power. But it is mostly based at how do you implement that, how you how you force your soft power in different ways, and how your domestic political dynamics will present you as a kind of a uh, soft power actor or not. So this is so important to understand one country's domestic political structure to observe it as a, as a pure soft power, pure soft power country or not. So this is the main issue that in here. That is why I would like to speak a little bit about, not a little actually, uh, quite a lot about uh, Turkey's domestic political transformations. So. What we know about Turkey, Turkey was a secular or what we call a laic country, but one day Erdogan has reached the power and abolished the that laic and Islamizing country. No, actually, this is not a true story. I mean, what we know that as the as the presenter of the of the Ottoman Empire, Turkey, yes, was founded in 1923, but not as a secular or a laic country that we call in Turkish. Turkey actually wasn't a laic country uh, until 1937, but Turkey established one state institution right after six months after the, 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 the establishment of the Republic, which is called Diyanet, Presidency, Presidency of Religious Affairs. Diyanet is a state institution. Is, uh, it is main duty is to control, regulate and run all the Sunni Islamic activities within the Turkish state on behalf of the Turkish society, but getting orders from the Turkish state. This means that we shouldn't, we couldn't talk about a crystal clear religion and state cut within the case of Turkey. I mean, uh, in 2009 dated, 2009 dated book, Ahmed Kru, Define the types of secularisms into three pieces in the in the world: uh, Anglo-Saxon type of secularism, French type of laicite, and Turkish type of laiklik. What is the main generis point of Turkish type of laiklik is mostly based on the foundation of Dianet, because Dianet's presence represents how Turkey preferred to manage, control, and regulate religious issues uh, in its domestic, uh, in its uh, territories by states for the good and benefit of the society. So within these circumstances, it is so hard to define Turkey as a purely secular country, likewise United Kingdom, likewise Sweden, or likewise Netherlands. Or it's also impossible to define Turkey as a laicit country, likewise France, or likewise, uh, likewise Ireland, but but Turkey has this a sui generis structure. Indeed, this likely also has transformed within the history and within the uh, previous century. And the last transformation has occurred during the Justice and Development Party period. Within this uh, transformation, what we can say that, uh, particularly after 1960s. Dianet has many has get many different great benefits from the uh, from the religious communities 
uh, inside the Turkey, and particularly after uh, 1970s with the foundation of the Turkish Diyanet Foundation, Turkey's Diyanet has reached, it is, has, uh, has changed its uh, limits and tried to start to organize and being an operationalization within the outside, uh, outside the borders of Turkey on, on the name of the supporting Turkish diasporas, supporting Muslim diasporas in Europe and all around the world. But this process is also quite significant because this process also the beginning of the Turkey's soft power because Turkey not using hard power, not using directly financial resources, not using directly uh, directly using the material forces, but mostly using ethno-religious and the cultural tools were using Diyanet and other uh, other uh, Turkey originated transnational Sunni Islamic groups. Turkey has been very active outside its borders. For example, in 1970s, Turkey has started to open new branches of Diyanet and Turkey originated religious apparatus, uh, religious uh, communities has started to organize uh, and getting, uh, getting an organizational structure in Germany, in Austria, in France, in United Kingdom. This is the beginning of the Turkey's religious soft power because Turkey as a secular, as a laic country still, trying to be an outsider actor where it is religious apparatus. I know it is a little bit of a uh, oxymoronic structure, but this is why it makes Turkey a little bit of an interesting and from my side of, uh, from my point of view, it's a little bit of a fascinating topic. For example, in here, you can see two uh, gentlemen. The, the one is the late uh, Turkish president, Turgut Özal, who has been pushing Turkey's Diyanet and Turkey's religious communities outside its territories just to show how Turkey can be influential in the religious and cultural area while using it is semi-Muslim, semi-laic, uh, semi-laic identity connotations. The other gentleman is named Fethullah Gülen. Now he's being, he's accused by the current Turkish government as the as the leader of the terrorist organization because as you know he is claimed to organize the uh coup attempt in 2016 but starting from 1980s he is the one who pushed by the state to create different kind of education business and religious oriented organizations outside of the turkey and this is the time when turkey state has reached uh, it started to reach to the Balkans, apart from the official state apparatus, apart from the embassies, the uh, Turkish state has started to reach the Balkans in late 1980s via religious and cultural official and semi-official Turkey originated apparatus. But what, what we saw that, I mean, before moving that PowerPoint, I mean, throughout the 19s, it was a little bit of a catastrophic process because in 1990s, Turkey has run by more than 10 different coalition governments. And there wasn't a unity, there wasn't a tightness within the domestic politics. Therefore, Turkey was not that eligible uh, to move to the Balkans. But what we know that, particularly with the beginning of the uh, second half of 1990s, Turkey has started to open new branches of Diyanet in the Balkans. Turkey has started to open new uh, semi-official uh, semi branches of the Gülen women's schools in the Balkans, particularly in, in, in Macedonia, in Albania, in Bulgaria, and right after in Bosnia and Serbia, particularly in Sanjak region, and then Montenegro, all around the Balkans. This is the first time that we can see that Turkey has become a visible actor with its religious apparatus and with its soft power tools in the Balkans. How it can happen? It was quite simple, actually, with the independence of the uh, Balkan countries. I mean, they mostly based on the Turkey's initiatives, but at the same time, with the invitation of the local actors, Turkey went to the region to serve the uh, Balkan Muslims because I mean, when I was conducting an interview in the region, what I realized that most of the uh, 
representatives and most of the state officers underline that if they didn't invite Turkey, if they didn't let Turkey to run some of the religious, cultural and identity based activities in the Balkans, the area was very gap and very Aristotelian understanding nature hates gap. And this gap might be filled by the other non ortho uh, other non uh, moderate Islamic actors, likewise Wahhabis, likewise Salafis or Iran. So therefore, based on their language, culture, history, and the religion commonalities, Balkan nations and the Turkey has created kind of a togetherness throughout the 1980s and throughout the 1990s. But what we saw that the main visibility, the main transformation has started within the Justice and Development Party period. The main reason of that, during the Justice and Development Party period, what we saw that particularly between 2002 to 2013, Turkey has been run by, by a single party government. Turkey has been run by a government with a huge financial opportunities. Turkey run by a government which is pro-democratic, which is pro-EU, which, which was, I'm sorry, which was a pro-democratic, which was a pro-EU, but at the same time, very, uh, has, has some identities of the leaders of that movement, Justice and Development Party movement uh, was was an Islamic background, but can be an example how Islam and democracy or the democratic values or the values of the liberal democracy can be compatible at the same time. This was the glorious part of the AKP story. But reading AKP as a unified story is one of the misreadings of this uh, misreadings of all of these pictures, because with because the AKP's political life is very much divided, different critical junctions, and every single critical junction has changed. It is uh, party's attitude in domestic policy and foreign policy. And today, as of today, after 2016, I define Turkey as a kind of an hegemonic power not all around the world, but uh, particularly in the Balkans, and playing a kind of an aggressive role uh, because of many different aspects that I, that I will speak a little bit about them later on, and, and became an ambivalent soft power actor in the region. Now, if you don't mind, I would like to speak a little bit about all of these critical junctions, and after how these critical junctions has transformed Turkey with all of these uh, I transformed Turkey and ended up today's uh, current scene. I mean, roughly 2010 until 2010, until 2000, Turkey, Turkey was a rising regional power and trying to be a global power. How it happened? Actually, if I would say something very bold and controversial, I would say that none of the emperors of the Roman Empire, none of the sultans of the Ottoman Empire, and none of the presidents of the Republic of Turkey sit on their chair alone. Even though they look like alone, or a single party, single party government, or a only one emperor, neither Konkurur Mehmet, nor Magnificent Suleyman, nor Atatürk, and neither must, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan sit their chair alone. They are the coming up situations of the unconventional coalitions. And within these unconventional coalitions, until 2010, roughly 2013, Erdogan managed to create a different kind of a coalition with liberals, with the uh, public figures who are very uh, pro-EU, with the different societies, different components who are pro-capitalist, pro-free uh, uh, neoliberal based free market economy, but at the same time they created a different coalitions with the <clears throat> with the Gulen movement. Within these coalitions, they created different kind of trans trans transatlantic alliances with liberal Western orders and who they were the hegemony all around the world. Therefore, they can promote themselves uh, all around the world, including the Balkans uh, until 2010. 
And at the same time, after particularly 9-11 and with the London bombings and then the terrorist attacks in France uh, with the first decade of the uh, new millennium, AKP and Erdogan was the only, and the Gülen moment, was the only figure that showed us how Islam can be cont- compatible with the uh, moderate Western values. Therefore, all of the Western powers promoted their, uh, their, their, their promoted justice and development party one way or another. And this gives them a kind of a legitimacy all around the world, including the Balkans. At the same time, they used many different uh, big mottos all around the world. For example, zero problems with neighbors or uh, previous prime minister and the foreign secretary Professor Ahmed Davutoglu's very famous concept, zero power, uh, zero, zero problem and strategic debt. What does it mean that strategic debt? Turkey has a strategical power. Turkey has a strategical importance that can easily solve every kind of problems almost all around the world, but particularly in its regions and within these regions that we saw the Balkans inside in it, because Turkey can be play a uh, older sibling, elderly sibling role with all of these problems. Well, within these circumstances, Turkey was a rising regional power, and they used that rising regional powers, uh, rising regional powers qualifications all around the world, but particularly in the Balkans, because in terms of the country hierarchies, it would be very easy to, to, for, for Turkey to implement new policy transformations to the Balkans. But this story is not uh, going went it very well, particularly after 2013, uh, starting from the, from the uh, Arab uprisings, and after after the Arab uprisings, uh, starting with the Turkey's economic crisis and the Erdogan's authoritarianism, we saw many different transformations within the Turkey's inside the domestic politics and foreign policies. The first thing is that Turkey was in crisis. I mean, the this crisis is quite, 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 quite deep because Turkey has been found itself is a trans, transatlantic alliances crisis because Turkey's authoritarian drift, Turkey's involvement to the Syrian conflict, Turkey's involvement to the northern Iraqi conflict, Turkey's economic and the political crisis in domestic politics created different kind of issues, different kind of problems, uh, different kind of problems with Turkey's Western allies. And within these Western allies, when Turkey found it as some kind of different problems with Western countries, Turkey tried to change its state to the Euro-Asian kind of alliances with China and with Russia. This has the beginning of the Turkey's identity transformation, and this transformation has definitely affected not only Turkey's domestic political issues, but also Turkey's foreign policy activities at the same time. The other thing is that Turkey's transformation within the foreign policy is also affected Turkey's inside coalition dynamics. Erdogan and Gülen movement uh, created a desire-based and very harsh total conflict uh, regarding who will be the main controller of the, the that big ship, namely, uh, namely uh, Turkey. And this conflict has been very dramatic. This conflict was very intense. And this conflict has also some religion sides as well. Within this conflict, two Sunni Islamic groups, Justice and Development Party and the Gülen movement, started the conflict all around the world, including the Balkans and including inside of the Turkey. And when they pushed that conflict within the religion area, they tried to promote themselves, we are the better Muslims than the others. So this also created another transformation and Islamic radicalization in Turkey's uh, domestic politics and foreign policy attitudes. But some experts expect that, I mean, that this transformation, this uh, democratic backsliding, this radicalization, Islamization, identity transformation would be ended, would end it in one day and Turkey would normalize again. Something happened in, uh, in July 15, 2016, which is the coup attempt. As I said, I mean, the government accused the Gülen movement and some other uh, 
uh, components within the state uh, regarding to the coup attempt. But after the coup attempt, Erdogan saw that coup attempt as a kind of a holy gift and started to transform not only it's in, in his position, but also Turkey's position um, in all around the world. Uh, after 2017, Turkey has been experiencing a deep Islamization. Turkey has been experiencing a deeper authoritarianism. Turkey has been experiencing a deeper loneliness all around the world. And this has affected Turkey's foreign policy vision and Turkey's soft power, uh, Turkey's soft power uh, instrumentalization all around the world and including the Balkans that I will talk later on. I mean, and with all of these processes, I think this is not very important. Turkey has increased its influence all around the world while using Islam as a flag. For example, within this map, you can see that uh, there is not that kind of map in the in the Balkans, but I found it one for Germany. These maps has been pointed to Turkey originated mosques in Germany. So, and this is a very shocking movement that we saw that Turkey has increased a lot its investment to the religion, to to the religion and Islamization in in foreign policy. And within Islamization, as I said, the AKP's conflict with the Gula movement and the war, I would definitely define it as a war, has a huge impact to the Turkey's transformation uh, with all around the world. And this transformation is also created a different kind of an issue that we call that the extraterritorial authoritarianism or the Turkey's new repertoire to extraterritorial repression. That I will talk a little bit of later what happened to the Balkans, but Turkey started, I mean, confiscations, targeted the uh, traitors all around the world and creating a negative propaganda to the uh, to the Erdogan's regime's opposition groups. And this has affected very negatively Turkey's Balkan relations. And the last point is that Turkey has involved a, a kind of a global revivery, uh, global revivery regarding who will be the uh, leader of the global UMA. This revivery is between uh, Saudi Arabia, between United Arab Emirates, between uh, Morocco and Turkey and Iran. Within this competition regarding who will be the leader of the global UMA, who will be the patron of the global UMA, Turkey found itself much more deeper Islamic roots in the foreign policy, and this will also affect the uh, positive relations with the Balkans. So, after I understood, I understand that much about uh, that much about Turkey's background. If we come back to the Balkans, what I can say that I mean, my new study is based on a field work, uh, more than four years, mostly covering Bulgaria, North Macedonia, and Albania. But beyond that, it has been covering Serbia, Bosnia, and also Kosovo, and argued that I mean, as an instinct part of an identity, religion, power, and their relations have the capacity to shape the politics and power relations as well as state identities. And what I argued that Turkey's all of these domestic political transformation has reflected very negatively, very problematically to it is Balkan presence, Balkan relations. And with all of these, can you hear me by the way? I can hear my voice right now. I can hear you very well. Okay, I st now it's gone. Okay, I, I started to hear my voice as well, and and the Turkey's and the Turkey's Balkan relations, and with this transformation is not state limited within the domestic politics and transformed to the Turkey's uh, foreign relations with the Balkans with many different ways. I mean, I I defined Turkey's transformation as a transformation of coercive ethno-religious transformation and the sunification of the Turkish state identity. But, I mean, for example, if I define Turkey as a coercive, ethno-nationalist, sunified country, and if I would like to conduct some interviews and understand the 
uh, Libyan, Libyan or the Syrian or the North African or Somalian state elites reactions to them, most probably I will get many positive feedbacks regarding that issues. But when I conducted more than 120 interviews, semi-structured elite interviews with expert political actors, diplomats, religious leaders and scholars, as well as journalists, uh, particularly in Bulgaria, North Macedonia, Albania, and all around the Balkans, I got like four essential different problematic points. And these points mostly regarding Turkey's transformation. I mean, what I can argue that Turkey, like many countries all around the world, is gradually withdrawing from an international cooperation and is restoring a new distinction, as I said in the PowerPoint, between Western understanding of civilization by synthesizing very subjective understanding of nationalism, nostalgic region of history, memory, and very banal understanding of religion. This transformation has been creating under the leadership of Erdogan, but this has been creating many different issues in many different countries, and it has it has been presented itself in different ways in the Balkans as four main issues. The first problem is that service to the global imam. I mean, what I'm trying to say regarding to the service to the global imam. When we look at the data of the Turkey's investments and Turkey's uh, visibility in the Balkans during the Justice and Development Party period, but particularly after 2010, we can see 45% increases in terms of investments, in terms of service, in terms of humanitarian aid uh, to the Balkans. This is a significant number when we compare to the 13% of increase in North Africa, 20% increase in the Asian Turkey countries, and 7% increase to the Western European countries. This means that the Balkans has been still a very important position for the current Turkish regime. But when we look at the distribution of these humanitarian aids, religion, cultural oriented support, or other activities of Turkey's transnational official and semi-official apparatus, what we saw that most of the uh, aids and support has been distributing to the Sunni Islamic groups or served for the Sunni Islamic structures, such as constructing mosques or rebuilding hospitals for them or regenerating some of the historical tools only, not only, but majoritarily to the Sunni Islamic groups. For example, when I talked with Baba Mondi in Albania in 2017, he described that he will not get any single particular visible support by Turkish government. But on the other hand, some of the Sunni Islamic groups have been getting some different, uh, some different and very visible support from Turkey. This imbalance creating a different connotation regarding Turkey's image in the region. This is the first problematic point. Previously, secular, laic Turkey tried to distribute it is economical power or economical investment capacity almost equally to the Balkans. But this new Turkey, new Turkey's preferences will go directly to the, and majority to the Sunni Islamic groups. This is the first problematic point. The second problematic point is that is regarding to the exportation of domestic conflicts. And what I'm saying that, as you might remember that, if one would like to ask me what would be the main determinant of the Turkey's domestic politics over the past decade, I would easily say that the conflict between Gulen movement and uh, Justice and Development Party, even though Currently, it seems that the conflict is over and the winner is obvious, Erdogan. The conflict is still invalid in the, in the Balkans. For example, as I said, extraterritorial repression, even though it would be very difficult to implement extraterritorial repression uh, implementations in the Western countries, it wasn't very difficult for Turkey to implement them in, in, the, in, in, in the Balkan countries. For example, in 2017, uh, Turkey state and intelligence service kidnapped 
seven Gülenis from Kosovo. At the same time, Turkey managed to shut down Turkey uh, Gülen movement orient, or originated universities, primary schools, newspapers, business administrations, and code on code, uh, philanthropy oriented agencies in North Macedonia, Albania, Bosnia, and Bulgaria, or forced them to change their names or to change their owners. This is the exploitation of domestic conflicts, and it has been creating a sovereignty problem for the Balkan countries. Because when I conducted interviews with the foreign ministry uh, staff and the government representatives in the Balkan countries, they saw that Turkey has been implementing that kind of desires and demands to the Balkan countries because Turkey saw the Balkan countries as, in terms of the hierarchy, lower than itself. Slower than itself. So this creating a sovereignty issue because all of these institutions, whether they are Turkey originated or not, they got an improvement by the local authorities, by the host countries, local administrations. But this has been creating many different issues. So exportation of domestic conflicts is definitely against the definition of being a normal, uh, very rational soft power. The third issue is interfering the internal affairs of the host countries. What I'm trying to say that Turkey starting being a mid power, very, uh, very moderate, uh, very moderate country in 1990s, converted itself as a country that believed that it is eligible to create zero problems with all the countries all around the world in the region. But and at the same time, uh, when it is when it is neighborhood, likewise the Balkans, and also eligible to eligible to involve every single problems and solve these problems while using its influence. But now Turkey interfering the internal affairs of the host countries. What I'm saying that Turkey trying to see that itself as the elderly siblings and trying to divide political parties trying to establish different political parties or involving the internal affairs of those countries. For example, in 2007, in 2018, uh, while using Diyanet stuff and while using imams in Bulgaria, Turkey divided historical Turkey or Turkish originated Bulgarian political party Dost into two pieces. But at the same time, Turkey has been not controlling directly but manipulating some of the Albanian and North Macedonian political parties. And these are also uh, have been occurring by using not only Islamic state apparatus, not only using Dianet and Imams, but at the same time using different kind of uh, religion oriented groups, but at the same time using different kind of uh, transnational state apparatus that has been using normally on the paper, using cultural values of Turkey in these countries. And this has been creating a different kind of uh, sovereignty problems among the Balkan countries. The last problem, particularly this is a problem for the non-Muslim groups and secular groups in the Balkans. Overdose use of ethno-nationalism, overdose use of ethno-religious components and using mostly religious motivation tools to involve these countries internal affairs and using Islam as a foreign policy tool, creating a different kind of fear and hesitation for mostly the local elites, non-Muslim local elites and secular local elites and mostly upper middle class local elites in the Balkans, whether Turkey has been destabilizing very fragile secular environments of the Balkan countries or not. For example, Whenever I talk with one of the Shalom organizations representing in Bulgaria, in Albania, in North Macedonia, in Serbia, they told that Turkey's overdose use of Islam and involving the Islamic competition in their countries has been destabilizing very fragile secular environments of Turkey. And this is again against the normal classical Turkey's attitude in the Balkans. I mean, these four issues is indeed only the one side of the coin. On the other side of the coin, as you can see from the photos, Turkey and particularly Erdogan has a big presence in the in the region, has a big value, has a big impact factor and has a big uh, importance in the region. But still, 
the transformation of Turkey, Turkey's domestic political critical junctions, and these outputs has been creating an ambivalent structure. And this ambivalence is mostly coming from Turkey's overdose use of religion and ethnic components and using and showing itself as a as a big player, as a big power for the region, and using it as authoritarian and aggressive tendencies, with it is reactive foreign policy attitudes, and this has been creating a different kind of problems uh, for the Balkans. At the end of the day, what I can argue that Turkey's transformation is not only transformed Turkey's policy behaviors, but also Turkey's perception to the Balkans. Turkey currently sees that Balkans is a unified structure and would always accept what Turkey will do to the region. But instead, Balkans has a, as a region has been classified by different countries and every single country has, has its own sovereignty. Every single different country has its own uh, dynamics, own priorities, social demographic, demographic qualifications. So Turkey, because of it is ethno-religious desire and transformation will making all of these issues almost half blind eyes and this will creating a new problems and if Turkey will continue like that it will not be any more a kind of a soft power currently it would be better to define Turkey as an ambivalent soft power of the in the region but I'm not sure if it will continue like that this ambivalent structure will continue for a long while and we will say that Turkey will be a very disturbing actor in the region and I'm, I'm afraid Turkey has been going on that direction uh, for a long period and I'm very much wondering what's going to happen next 